Hello, this is Tommy Franks. Welcome to the Four Star Leadership Podcast, a product of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum. We're here to get a view into the lives of the legacy makers, the movers and the shakers of today, to offer insights from the full spectrum of the leadership community. We'll talk to former Four Star students and explore their leadership development path. We'll work to find out what they are about today and learn from the opportunities they've made for themselves in this world. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this podcast. Remember, leaders are not born, they're developed. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Core Principles of Leadership with General Tommy Franks. I'm your host, Elise Travis. We're on episode number 22 with our guest, Dr. James Carafano. We'll be talking about what inspired him as a young man, led him to his work, and how leading a team requires critical thinking. But before we get into our program, we'll have a word from our major sponsor, REI Oklahoma. REI Oklahoma is proud to be a part of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute in the production and distribution of these podcasts designed to inspire leaders and difference makers. At REI Oklahoma, we have been working with small business leaders, entrepreneurs, and people who are driven to succeed for years. Highly motivated people working to own their own businesses, live in their own homes, and make the world a better place. Since its beginning, REI Oklahoma has continued to identify hurdles and deliver holistic solutions to create job growth and help neighborhoods thrive in both rural and urban communities. REI Oklahoma looks forward to visiting with you about helping your business and community grow. Visit reiok.org or call 800-658-2823 to start the conversation. The Labar family is a fourth-generation Oklahoma family. That may not sound like a long time, but our grandfathers were born here, within the Comanche Nation, before the land run. We are the proudest sponsor of the Tommy Franks Four Star Leadership Podcast. We hope listeners will heed the words of these distinguished men and women who have served our country at the highest levels and across all walks of life. Dr. James J. Carafano currently serves as the Heritage Foundation's Vice President Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy. He is a leading expert in national security and foreign policy challenges, an accomplished historian and teacher, and a prolific writer and researcher. Carafano is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and served 25 years in the U.S. Army, retiring as a lieutenant colonel. He holds a master's degree and a doctorate from Georgetown University as well as a master's degree in strategy from the U.S. Army War College. His recent research has focused on developing the national security required to secure the long-term interests of the United States, protecting the public, providing for economic growth, and preserving civil liberties. Please welcome Dr. James Carafano. Okay, good afternoon, Dr. James Carafano. Thank you so much for joining us today. And well, it's we, great to be with you. Well, thank you. We're, we're absolutely thrilled to have you here and, and really honored to be able to share some of your background and experience and, and thoughts for our young leaders and our listening audience. Um, can you tell us, uh, we've just reviewed your bio, of course, and so can you tell us a little bit about where you're from initially and, and your family? Yeah, I actually think that's a really important question, and I'll tell you why in just a second. So I, I grew up in, in suburban Long Island. I was actually born in New York City, but but raised in Long Island. I think probably the most significant thing about my background is uh, I come from a family that was really committed to selfless service. My my dad was a cop. My mom was a cop. My sister's a nurse. My brother-in-law's a cop. My brother's a cop. He was also in the Army. Uh, my nieces are all nurses. Uh, my son's a doctor. I mean, so in, in for some reason, our family has just always been drawn to the notion of the greatest reward is to to give back to the community that that brought you. And 
the reason why I say that is significant is, you know, I went to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, of course, whose motto is duty, honor, country. But when I got there, I really felt like, well, what's the big deal? Doesn't everybody think this way? Because that was just the that was just my upbringing. I was I was taught to um, to be responsible for yourself, uh, to love your country, to 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 see the value in giving back and and really the joy and the the self-satisfaction that comes from building a better community by by serving others. I can absolutely see how that started you on the path to where you are and and what you do. Did um did you do anything when you were in high school that kind of got you started on that path that where you knew you wanted to go to college and and that type of thing? Well, you know, I I think probably the most valuable thing uh, that I did in high school was, you know, I was not uh, a, a natural athlete when I was young. I was actually pretty small and I grew later on, but I didn't know that was going to happen. But I, I tried out for sports anyway because I wanted to challenge myself. I, I took a lot of challenging subjects in high school. And, and I think one of the things I discovered, and, and I think this is maybe the most important thing as a young person is, look. Um, it's important to know who you are, what your what your strengths are, and what your weaknesses are. And and when you understand your weaknesses, there's a difference between something not being a strength because it's just not you. You don't like it. You're not comfortable with it. It's just not who you are. And you've just never done it before, and you haven't tried it. And uh, so sports for me was was not something that came naturally, but but I I decided to try it. it turned out. I, I was I was pretty good at it. And then, you know, of course, sports really builds teamwork. And that was another skill set. Um, you know, I think the same way with with different subjects in high school and and even leadership challenges in high school. These were things that I wasn't really natural at, but I I thought I should try them. And, and in many cases, you know, there were things I discovered that, nope, that's just not me. But there are other things I discovered. Wow, I actually could be the, good at this if I if I applied myself to it. And that was a a, a great journey of self-discovery one that i i took in into um, college and into my career and and really i think is something i would always commend to young people you have to discover who you are Wh- what what gives you joy what gives you a sense of fulfillment and and what you're good at, at but never shy away from things just because you haven't tried them i think that's some some great great ideas for young people and thoughts to, to move forward. So at what point did you decide where you wanted to go to college and what your degree was going to be? Yeah, I, this is actually not a very noble story. <laughs> my, my dad was uh, in the, in the military for 11 years before he got out and became a cop. Um, he fought in the Korean war. He had 18 months of combat time. His, most revered officer was a lieutenant that was his platoon leader uh, who was killed in action in Korea. But my dad just idolized this man and and he happened to have been a West Point graduate. And so for my entire dad's adult life, this this guy represented to him everything about West Point. So he just figured that West Point must be the, the best place on the first of the earth. And I actually hadn't, didn't really, wasn't really thinking about a military career and, and I uh, applied to actually go to school at the University of Florida, and then I I uh, had a sports recruiter come in from West Point, and, and my dad said, "We'll send this stuff in anyway." And I actually got accepted at the University of Florida first, and I was all excited to go. And my dad said, well, "Why don't you wait to find out from West Point?" And then I got the acceptance letter at West Point. You know, it comes like this big scroll, like it just won the lottery or something. And I just took one look at my dad's face, and I said, "Oh, I guess I'm going to West Point because I just..." I could never disappoint my father. Um, and, and I went and, and the funny thing was, you know, I got to the academy and uh, and I loved it. I, I, I love the challenge. I, I love the opportunity. I love doing different things that my other, you know, friends from high school weren't doing and stuff. And uh, ironically, there were only two of us from my high school that went to West Point. One guy had wanted to go to the academy his entire life. And I was completely indifferent and, and actually didn't even know what I was getting into. And and the guy that little loved it, he the second he got there, he hated it and he quit after the first year. So um, um, I guess it goes back to the motto of of you don't 
you know, don't bypass challenges and opportunities because there might be something there. So, uh, but my dad was right about West Point. It was a place where I was going to be happy and comfortable because it the the idea of selfless service, the idea of, of challenging yourself, um, of being accountable for yourself. Those are all things that um, I think really helped me in my, my maturing and, and development as a young adult. So would you say this gentleman that your dad um, looked up to, he was both a mentor to your dad and, and then consequently to you as well? Yeah, you know, he was he was only a second lieutenant. So, I mean, he couldn't have had much more combat time than my dad. And, and of course, he probably was in his very early 20s. Uh, there's a building at West Point called Cullum Hall, which is uh, uh, used to be the old kind of alumni building. And uh, there's a, a bronze plaque there of um, all the West Point graduates who died in the Korean War. And uh, I went there. Uh, I found his name of this lieutenant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, you know, I just always, between him and my dad, I just always feel like that's people looking over my shoulder, judging me whether, whether, whether I'm measuring up. So I would say this gentleman exhibited great character and that's what your father really truly admired about this person. Uh, you know, there are three things which I, I, I didn't realize we're being, because you don't know when you're 18 or 19 or 20 years old, really, what in your experience as a young adult is really forming and is really, really important. And in many ways, those things only become apparent to you later on in life. But there were there were three elements of the educational experience, which which I think were symbolic of what really makes an effective leader. And, and I often talk about character, competence, and critical thinking. Character is this idea of doing the right things for the right reason, not because you're told to, not because you're ordered to, not because you're held accountable if you don't, but because it's simply the right thing to do. To me, that's the quintessential judgment of character. Um, competence is is the is to having the skills uh, to do the job that you're assigned to do or, or that you're asked to do. Uh, and then critical thinking is really the, the ability to make judgment, both you know, in a deliberative way, but also under under pressure when things are really, really difficult. And remarkably, you know, today, I, look, I'm in a job where I, you know, I talk to presidents and prime ministers and generals and, you know, leaders from all over the world. And and I can list the ones that I greatly admire. And without question, they all have those three elements. And And I think people a lot of times, character is particularly important. We confuse character with characteristics. So we think because General MacArthur had swagger, he was a great leader, or because Patton could put his hands on a hip, he was a great. But these are just characteristics of people. Uh, what really matters is the the underlying efficacy, of the, their underlying morality of are they doing the right things for the right reason? And I can I can tell you, without you know reservation, that when all the great mentors and leaders I've met in my career, and all the great men and women that I've I've worked with in my decades in public policy. They are people of character. They are people of competence, and they are people of deep, deep and serious thought. Whether it's making a snap judgment in one moment of crisis, or deliberating on an incredibly difficult challenge that requires just hard thinking and and sober judgment. So at West Point, would you say that was your defining moment in your leadership journey that you were where you were supposed to be, and how you know, did I, that, would you say that? No, I no, I actually I think I actually came out of West Point and and I I ne wasn't necessarily the most mature person. Um I don't think anybody is necessarily coming it was some people are maybe coming out of college, but you you know, I learned a lot of important things in college, but there's a difference between what you learn in school and what you do in real life. And and I think to me a lot of the most admired leaders I have have both this, you know, obviously they were well educated and but they also had life experience which really fused that together. Um I I was not a natural leader because honestly I, I didn't like leading people. I found it kind of burdensome. It's I'd just rather do stuff myself. You know, I if we had a group project, I would tell the other guys, just you guys just I'll go do the group project and get it done and I'll call you when it's done. And because it was just easier than me than actually trying to get other people to do stuff. 
And it was really when I was in the army, and, you know, we, and they taught me a lot of leadership lessons in college and everything, but none of that really counted. But when I was in the army and I had leaders who really forced me to lead um, and uh, and put me in situations where I where I actually had to lead people and I had to be successful and in some cases where lives were on the line. That, I think, is what taught the fine lessons that I had in college, but they really didn't have grit and meaning for me until I had to uh, apply them in real life. So the team and that's when I grew up. Yes. The teamwork at uh, the critical thinking for the teamwork, would you say that was more of your defining moment? Have you yeah, considered I, I, the whole team? No, I, yeah, I think it was that, you know, the, 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 there's a difference between getting a, getting something done, which anybody can do and getting a group of people to pull together to get it done. That's a, that's a very, very different level of, and we never really did that. I mean, we had, you know, at the academy, you had military positions and officers in the chain, of, but you're not really, because if you fail, well, nothing is really going to happen. But but when you're out there in the real world and you have a real job to get done, uh, and it can only get done by having people pull together to do it. And more importantly, you discover is once you get people to do stuff together and achieve things, well, then you can get so much more done than you can do yourself. Uh, and then, of course, in the military, you know, you, you might get run over by a truck or, you know, whatever, and you might not be there. Uh, and but things still have to get done. So getting people to get to get the right things done, whether you're not even there or not. I mean, this is the real essence of leadership and the great value. And I, I really hold it. I had two mentors and I think people understand mentorship in the wrong way. Mentorship isn't about somebody that's nice to you or listens to you or helps you get a job. Mentorship are about people who look at you and say, there's value in this person and I can do stuff to help them be a better person, better at who they are. And I had two leaders, which were not nice men and were not, um, you know, they were very difficult and very, very demanding. But for some reason, they invested in me to push me to be a better leader. And and honestly, if, if they had not challenged me to do that, pushed me to do that, taught me what to do, held me accountable for what I was doing, I, I, I would have never matured uh, as a leader. So really, I, I owe really everything to them. So inspiration doesn't always uh, isn't always a feel good, warm and fuzzy thing. I I understand that sometimes it's it's a really hard thing when someone inspires you to to be your very best that you can be. I I really I really believe that's that's true, and it's there's this there's a big distinction between people who are mean spirited and difficult and demanding just because you know they're they're not very good people and and people who care so much about you that they care enough that you they don't that they don't care whether you like them or not <laughs> they care enough to to invest in you you know whether you whether you uh ad, admire it or not and uh I, you you know it when you when you see it because and the reason for that is very very simple because no matter how they treated me I knew that they were trying to do the right thing and make choices for the right reason. I, I see that even today. I've uh, uh, we have a new president of our foundation, um, and the thing I admire most about him is his commitment to doing the right thing for the right reasons. And to me, uh, those are really the most effective leaders in the long term. I agree. I I think. You never have to apologize for doing the right thing, I don't think, really. So tell us more about after you uh, left West Point and where um, where you kind of went after that. What inspired you to on your leadership journey of what you've done and accomplished? You have a tremendous, tremendous well, wealth of experience. Well, one of the great things about the military is uh, you move frequently. And so typically an assignment is three years in length, which which means you're always getting new jobs, new opportunities, new chances to challenge yourself. But it also means that, that you're working with different people. So if a unit has a 
if you're, if you're in a unit for three years, that means uh, like every year, a third of the people are different. Uh, and I always kind of found like the first year I was in a job, I'd make all my mistakes. The second year, I would prove that I learned all my mistakes and not do them again and do them better. And the third year, I was confident enough to say, okay, now I can really you know, put my own stamp on this. Um, and so it, in many ways, it was a great laboratory of learning because you got to learn from your mistakes, you got to experiment with things, and you got to kind of make things your own, right? Your own stamp on them. And so I really enjoyed that. I had really diverse assignments. I was in Korea, I was in Germany. Uh, I was at uh, um, Fort Sill, the home of the field artillery. Um, I got to go to graduate school, go back to West Point and teach. So I, I had a lot of diversity of, of assignments. And then at the, the end of my career, I came back to Washington. I was the speechwriter for the Army Chief of Staff, which was great because I really got to see leaders at, in a very intimate way at the most senior level possible under enormous pressure uh, and in very intimate settings. And so that was really a great experience for me. And then before I retired, I got I was the editor of a journal called Joint Force Quarterly that Colin Powell started when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And that was a great opportunity because, again, I got to work with a lot of different people. I got to work with a lot of civilians. It also kept me in Washington for a number of years. And so I, I kind of made a very seamless transition into the it's the nonprofit world. I mean, a, a think tank a research institution in Washington, but but you're doing research on public policy. So you're also around a lot of political people and private sector and elected leaders and foreign leaders. All my military experience was kind of a great preparation for that. And uh, so I've, I've really only had two jobs and I've never had a job interview. So I was in the army for 25 years and I've been uh, in the think tank business actually for 20, 21 years now. So can you share with us the culture that you brought, that you learned and brought with you into um, the private sector? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, one of the reasons why I've stayed at uh, the Heritage Foundation, which is a think tank for for 20 years, is in many ways to me, it felt exactly like the Army. Uh, you know, except we're not wearing uniforms. I get paid a little more um, because uh, it, it's an institution that has a sense of mission and purpose. Uh, and that people that work here are primarily here because they believe in the mission. So, you know, I say our job is to help keep America free, safe and prosperous. So it's develop policy proposals that do that, um, help try to help leaders implement them. So it feels very much like I'm still in the military, except you know, there's there's no foxholes, there's no rainy days outside. Um, you know, ironically, and this is, you know, I was in the army for 25 years, but you know, I, I was commissioned after the Vietnam War, and uh, you know, the military had very little combat in the intervening years, and then I I retired just really before the the global war on terror really kicked off. 25 years, I was actually never deployed to a combat zone, and Heritage, I've been to combat zones twice, so I'm not really sure how that works out, but <laughs> but there you go. So. You are also, um, you continue your servant leadership just as, as your family did. Um, you've co-authored a number of books, and one is on Homeland Security, A Practical Introduction to Every light, Day Life in the New Era of Tourism. Can you share with us about that and what prompted you to offer that to the world? Well, I, I, you know, because I do really believe in this model of character, competence, and critical thinking, I, I've always maintained that the, the journey of kind of self-discovery and self-development, self-education never really stops. So you continue, if you want to be at the top of your profession, whatever it is, you continue to be a learning leader to learn and develop and grow. Um, one way you can do that, although I do that, is, is through teaching and through writing, which prompts me to be serious and intro, introspective about what I'm seeing. So the interesting thing about the Homeland Security book was I, I was actually teaching Homeland Security after 9-11 in a number of different universities. And there was no textbook on Homeland Security at the time. And what I actually did was I, I had a lot of ex practical experience. I was conveying that in the classroom. And then by teaching the students in the classroom, I really understood what was relevant to things people to know. So as opposed to an academic that writes a textbook 
and says, here's what real world people do. I, I looked at what real world people did and I tried to put that into a book. And so actually what's interesting is there's actually three editions of the Homeland Security textbook. And that's important because the enterprise has been evolving. What we were dealing with under President Bush, for example, is very different when we're dealing under President Obama. It's different from what we're dealing with under President Trump, different issues, focus on terrorism, um, immigration, national security, domestic threats. So trying to understand and adapt that and really speak to a, a broad audience, not in a partisan way, but look, we're all Americans. We all live in communities. We all deserve to be free and safe in our community. So to address that in a way that was accessible to everybody on all sides of, of some very divisive political debates and on homeland security and some other issues was interesting and a real challenge. And I, and I really enjoyed that. I think in in all of the books that I have written, uh, they they came from a, a compulsion to understand a problem uh, and then to try to share with people my journey of discovery and what I think might be helpful for them. I wrote a, a book on social networking um, uh, called Wiki at War, which which was actually when social networks were area mature in the early days of MySpace and Facebook. And I think even started it even before Twitter was really off the ground. And and uh, I didn't need, I didn't have a thesis transforming how we live, you know, particularly in the national security space. And so I actually had a contract to write a book that I, that I didn't know what the book was about. Um, but it was exciting for me to to learn that. I mean, similarly thing, I wrote a book about um, the use of contractors in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And when I started, I really didn't have an opinion if this was a good idea or a bad idea. But I, I used the I, the, I I was excited about the process of, of research and learning because I understand the, the I think the worst I always tell my students if, if if they come in with a research project and I tell my researchers the same thing and I tell people in it it's like I want to prove that I said well look this is not a research project this is advocacy a research project means that you truly have a question that you don't know the answer to and you're having the courage to go out and objectively seek the answer. That's a research project. So when you come to me, we, 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 well, I already have the answer. I just want to prove it. Then I, then, then just tells me that you're not really interested in, in true inquiry. Let's pause for just a moment to hear from one of our great sponsors. Hello, this is Jay Zacharias with the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum, and I would like to tell you about one of our partner sponsors. His name is Justin Krieger, and he has worked as an independent insurance agent at Krieger Insurance Agency in his hometown of Hobart, Oklahoma, since 1999. Justin is honored to help with the annual Celebration of Freedom event and has been a board member for the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum for many years. He is also a fifth generation farmer and rancher in Kiowa County, where cattle, crops, and even insurance is sold with a handshake. Give him a call at 580-726-3076 or come by the office if you would like to speak with Justin Krieger or Kathy Lankford about insurance. We are thankful to our customers and friends who have supported us through the years. Again, Justin would like to say how honored he is to live in such a great country and how proud he is to help sponsor these podcasts. Please enjoy the rest of this podcast experience from your friends at Krieger Insurance Agency. Now let's get back to our episode. So I'm thinking that there's it, there's no problem in keeping people motivated uh, about Homeland Security because it's it's basically a moving target all the time. Um, what is most... well, what you find? No, I mean, what you actually find in public policy is every and and you will see this in real life too. I mean, it doesn't matter what you are if you're working in Walmart or if you're the head of a nonprofit or a church or everybody is distracted by the intensity of the present uh, and. And to 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 step back and understand not just the crisis of the moment, but what are the implications of that? What are the long that that I think is the real art of public policy. So it is it's not hard to get people excited. We're all excited and crazy about something. It is hard to get people focused on what's important. 
And so it's it is constantly a challenge in the public policy space to you know people want to do things to get them off their plate to get people to stop yelling at them to get somebody to give them a donation to, but it, but that's not the same as doing something because it's the right thing to do and it'll lead to good outcomes for for the for and so kind of having the discipline to kind of try to get people back on task about what's really important here and and think about what they're really doing that that boy, I, I think with every public policy I work with, whether it's homeland security or national security issues or or foreign policy or trade or diplomacy, it it it's all it is actually always a challenge to keep. And you'll see this in the workplace as well. Um, you know, people want to come in, they want to do what they always do, they want to deal with what's in their inbox. That but that doesn't necessarily mean you're getting people focused on the things that are most important, most productive, and most useful and most needed. Would you say that is what is most on the minds of leaders in your organization? Absolutely. I think that's what we try to argue, you know, maybe um, distinguishes us from other groups is this clarity of focus. And and again, this is one of the things that you, you know, that I learned in the military is um, the importance of mission. You know, we used to have this saying in um, Mission first, people always, which kind of sounds incongruent. Um, but or uh, um, one general famously said, "It says, you know, the army, the people are the army." But this idea of that you have something you need to get accomplished, but at the same time you want to do the best for for the people that are working for you, that you're working with, that you're supporting, and there is sometimes a natural tension between those two things. And the same mission first people always is, well, what's more important, getting the job done or developing your people, supporting your people, growing them? And the answer is yes, both. And and I actually think that that's healthy. I think one of the great things is having really important things in natural tension is not a problem. It's actually a blessing because what it forces you to do is to try to come up with what are really the best answers. So if you look at the U.S. Constitution, for example, in the preamble, it says provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare and happiness and all this stuff. And obviously, these things could come into tension. And 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 I think the founding fathers go, yes, that's exactly what we want. We don't want to make it easy for you and say, should you be secure? Um, should you protect people's freedom or should you make them prosperous? Um, the Chinese do this all the time. They just pick one. Right. All we think all those things are foundational to a strong and healthy society. And if you prioritize them, inevitably what will happen is you'll get one to the extreme and the others will get marginalized. And what you want is none of them marginalized, none of them compromised. And so to, to come up with solutions that are good for, for our prosperity and our freedom and our security is actually quite difficult. But by putting those things in tension, you always force yourself to try. You'll, you'll see the same thing if you're doing something and you go, well, I can get this accomplished, you know, but I'll you know, burn all my people out. Okay, well, maybe that's required, but but also you want to develop and promote your people. So, you know, you never compromise the most important thing. So it is always the and this is the notion of selfless service. You put the most important things first, God, your country, um, your community, your stakeholders, uh, and you try to do the best for all of them. Uh, but you but you compromise last on the things that are absolutely most in, vital and important. Um, and then you put your and the idea of selfless service is you always put yourself last, which I know sounds is which is actually very selfish because first of all, by putting yourself last, other people respect and honor you because they understand that you're trying to do the right thing for the right reasons. The other thing is is by putting yourself last, you're fulfilling that 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 commitment to your mission and your job, and it, and that's actually quite self fulfilling. So it sounds very, you know, Thomas Aquinas or you know, to put yourself last. But by putting yourself last, you're actually putting yourself first because you're being true to what really gives you value and also what really contributes to your success. So the more, the most important attribute that you would say to help leaders be successful today, what would that be? Well, like I said, I I, I do think that that um, selfless service is a very powerful 
thing. But you know what? You can be selfless and stupid. Um, you know, we, you can be well-meaning and get disastrous results. So, uh, you know, when you apply for a job in the U.S. government, they, they often talk about you have to have skills, knowledge, and attributes. You know, knowledge, what you know, skills, the things you can do, and attributes, the kind of person that you are. And and I actually think that's a very apt way to describe it, that, you know, you need somebody that's the whole package. You know, if, if you go a boxer in a ring, okay, maybe he's a great puncher, but if he's not a good counterpuncher or he doesn't have any stamina, he's never going to win a world, you know, he's never going to win a, a, a world title. If you have a baseball team that, yeah, they can score a lot of points, but they have no defense, they're never going to win either. So when you say, well, boil it down to one thing, I, I think it's the package. You know, it's the leaders that bring the package to the table. Uh, you know, again, it's not characteristics. It's not how handsome they are or how dashing or clever or witty. It's how committed are they, how skilled are they, and how 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 um, how how the judgment that they bring in exercising um, their knowledge uh, and uh, and Im implementing their character that really really makes um, the difference. And if I'm understanding you correctly, it's it's also about caring about the people that you're leading and so that they trust you. They know you care about them and, and you're invested in them and their leadership development. And it makes a huge difference. I, I think it absolutely, absolutely does. Is no matter how amazing and talented you are as an individual. And look, I have all the respect in the world for that. And it's like saying, you know, discover who you are and be true to yourself. Maybe you're the most amazing, you know, rock star ever. Uh, okay, fine. That's not my greatest skill set. My greatest skill set is getting a group of people together to accomplish very difficult things under very, very difficult conditions and being successful. Um, that, 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 that's why I do, you know, that's why I do what I do. Uh, it's not for everybody. It, 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 it is hard. Uh, you know, but whatever you see, if you you see these people that climb mountains without ropes and win world championships, and they make it look effortless. But the reality is, is to get where they had to to the level of achievement of true excellence, that's an enormous amount of commitment. And people say, well, "I'm a naturally." There's a zillion naturally gifted singers or people that can play the piano by listening, but to be, become the best uh, and fully accomplish what you're trying to do. That just takes a lot of sweat equity and experience. And I think to me, that's the number one lesson as a young, well, look, as a young person is the, the life experience is it's, it's not only kind of adding, you know, tools into the tool bag. So you've got more skill sets. It's learning who you are, and what you're good at, and what you're not good at. And, and but it, it's also the, the, it's the, the life experience is what's building you to become a better leader. Uh, nobody is Napoleon. Not even Napoleon was Napoleon when he was 19 years old. Uh, it it life it takes life experience to do these things. You know the, the way you become a great leader is you is you lead people, you make your mistakes and 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 then you learn and grow. The way you become a great writer is you do a lot of writing. And you know the way you become a pub, great public speaker is you, you talk a lot. So you got to put in the work to really reach the level of it. Even influencers, you know, today we look at TikTok and YouTube uh, and reels and stuff and go, Oh, look at this person. They're 22 years old. They, they, and they're famous and rich and, and they don't do anything except like put on makeup. Well, actually, if you know anything about how influencers become, they put a lot of work into what they do. They, they learn the lessons of what works and what doesn't work. And they probably commit more to achieve excellence than 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 most people do in their lifetime. There's almost nothing where you become accomplished and powerful and important by just people handing it to you. And so I think you're saying to be willing to do the work of self-discovery and understand who you are, what your particular talents or gifts are, and be willing to be a star in your own constellation. Not everyone can be a, a star for the entire world, but be willing to do the work to be a star in your own constellation and shine there. 
Yeah, I, I mean, you can't ever predict whether somebody's going to be a four-star general or win an Oscar or something, but um, we know what gets you to that point. But I would say you have to have joy in the work, like joy in the process of getting there. So it, you know, people that run marathons, they develop a love of running. Whether they win an Olympic marathon or not, they they wouldn't be running unless they got and when I say joy, I don't mean happy. <laughs> There's lots of things I do every day that don't make me happy. But every day I want to come up and go to work because my work gives me joy in the sense that it's a fulfillment that I'm doing something important. You know, I often tell a lot of people, uh, young people, and they ask, Well, what should I study? And they go, you know, should I you know study terrorism or you know, should and I said, Look, no matter what you study, the the wrong reason to want to be an expert on something is think it'll get a job. Because you know, today we might want an, a room full of Russian speakers, and you know tomorrow we might might want a room full of economists. And if you if you truly want to be great at something, you should you should focus on it because it is that issue or subject that gives you. I have analysts here who worked on regions for twenty or thirty years. I could not pay them; they would still show up for work because they're doing it for the right reasons. They're passionate about their issue. They're passionate about their job. And uh, so, you know, something sometimes we say, what makes you happy? People equate that, well, do I make a lot of money? You know, am I laughing? You know, happiness is, you know, some of the hardest working people have very low levels of stress. And and people, well, how could that be? Well, the answer is, is because they actually thrive in what they're doing. It, it gives them a sense of worth and accomplishment. My, you know, my dad once said that, a great job is wanting to get go to work in the morning. And 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 I think he was right. If you don't want to get up and go to work, in, not that you're like excited about something, you're, but if you don't want to get up and go to work in the morning, you know what? You're probably in the wrong job. What you do that gives you a great sense of fulfillment and achievement, it would be your passion and what inspires you. And to me, it's, and it's, it's a sense of mission. It's having a mission that you think is, helpful and worthwhile to others and then committing yourself to to trying to achieve that i i just find that and i i don't know like i said i mean like that's for me that was my family ethos i think that i was raised and trained in you know as i as i look in as a historian uh free societies i you cannot find a free society that endured or prospered without people who were selfless in their commitment to that society. Uh, every That's just, it's just a component of freedom. Some people in the society have to invest in protecting and securing that freedom. Other, otherwise that they won't endure. And I, I think the, the, the logic of this is, this is the difference I think some, between something like philosophers, like a John Locke and a Hobbes, you know, Hobbes thought our innate natures were, greedy and and selfish and uh and that if we were just left to our own devices we would life would be nasty brutish and short and john Locke said no he says there's a better nature in humans that if you allow people to express their free nature some people there are there are people that will invest in this the selflessness and 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 they will and they will endure and protect the freedom of others and and not be jealous or or upset that other people are going out and you know doing whatever the heck they want. Um, I I think you know one of the, dis, the, the one of the distinguishing features of a healthy society is you cannot denigrate people who are sacrificing for others. Uh, and there and on the other hand, you don't you don't bemoan people who say, well, I I don't want to serve in the military. I don't want to be a cop. I don't want to be a nurse. I want to be a rock star. Well, fine, that's great, but as part of being recognized that part of your success at the, as a rock star is there are other people in the society that are willing to make sacrifices on your behalf. And again, if you force somebody to make a sacrifice, force them into the draft, force them to be a cop, you know, that that's not freedom. But when they freely do that of their own volition, they're, that that is really what creates this healthy and productive society. And it's remarkable that when you have open free societies, there will always be an abundance of people who choose to give back and invest in the community. 
it's shocking. Uh, we're not all selfish. Uh, but we're selfish in different ways. Some of us are selfish by 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 our, our willingness and lovingness to give back. You know, I know that you came about seven years ago and spoke to our leadership students. And uh, we appreciate that so much. That was before my time, but I understand that you did. And I'm wondering, was the message that you delivered seven years ago different than the message you would deliver today? What, what would you say to our leadership students today? And is it different? Yeah. No, I probably wouldn't say anything different. I, I would actually say the older I become, the more sure I become about mankind. And... Uh, about humanity and what ennobles and nourishes humanity and what doesn't. Uh, I was just in Ukraine. Um, I, I, I saw what, what those people, what Ukrainians are putting up with fighting for their own freedom and liberty, the, the enormous destruction done on innocent civilians. Uh, I was in uh, Azerbaijan not long ago, country, the girl Karabakh area devastated by decades of, of war. I mean, more, more barren than, than the plains of Carthage after the Punic Wars. Um, the more I see of humanity, the more I'm convinced that there really is good and evil and and that nourishing good is what what, what builds healthy and constructive and positive societies. So um I I I don't think I don't think my views are gonna change <laughs> at this point. I was just curious if, if your thoughts had changed about or the message that you would give to students. And so because our students are, are average age 17, do you do you have any idea what you would say to your 17 year old self that you would share with our students and our and our listening audience? Well, it, look, I, like I said, I think you have to discover who you are. And 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 what brings you joy and. um and and how to fulfill that you know my dad was a cop never got a college education perfectly happy being a cop um the day he retired when he was 45 which is because you could be a cop 20 years and retire never worked another day in the rest of his life so he actually he his his retired life was longer than his working life um because he lived to be 90 um but my dad was true to who he was he was i'll work hard and when my job is done you know, I will rest and I will spend time with my family and my kids and I will be happy and content in that. Um, he has, he had four kids. All of us are still working. Most of us have retired multiple times. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, you know, we're, you know, we're just different. We, we, you know, we, we just love the work and the way that my, my dad um, did, but that's okay. Um, but the, when you're 17 years old, you have to discover who you are and you don't discover who you are by sitting and waiting for the world to come to you. You discovered who you are by getting out in the world and learning uh, and and asking, you know, a, and being true and honest to yourself. You know, uh, I've always, I had a lot of choices to make in my life and my career. Uh, I, and some of them were really quite difficult. And in the end, I, I always came to believe there's a little tiny voice inside you that tells you what you really ought to do. And you should listen to that li little tiny voice. So, People shouldn't listen to their peers. And they say they shouldn't listen to their parents. I mean, you should listen to everybody. But in the end of the day, you have to you have to take responsibility for your life because it's yours. And nobody can do that for you. And and you cannot live a full and satisfied life by waiting for the world to just come to you and hand you something on a platter. Uh, you have to go out and discover yourself and then be true to yourself. Thank you so much for those words. I, I appreciate it. And I know they're of great value to both our students and our listening audience. And thank you so much for your time today. We really, really appreciate it. You have such a wealth of experience and, and knowledge. And it's it's truly amazing. And your, well, you. your bio you. is truly amazing. And I can imagine that your lectures uh, can get quite spirited and interesting with a tremendous amount of questions. Yeah, let's go with spirited. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having me.
<laughs> well, thank you so much. We truly appreciate it and have a lovely rest of your day. And thank you for the time that you've invested in our leadership program. Oh, it's a great program. I mean, I've always been a tremendous fan and, and it's, let me tell you, it is so valuable the, of all the things that you can have in your toolkit to bring value and change the world. Nothing is more valuable than the ability to, to lead other people with character and courage. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Bye-bye. Thank you again to REI Oklahoma for making this podcast possible. For nearly 40 years, the board, staff, patrons, and supporters of the nonprofit economic development REI Oklahoma are committed to expanding Oklahoma's economic prosperity, earning the reputation of being one of the most comprehensive economic development organizations in the country. Business loans, training workshops, business consulting, and networking opportunities, as well as technical assistance and even commercial business space are made available to Oklahoma entrepreneurs and small businesses. For low and moderate income individuals and families, down payment and or closing cost assistance is offered. Learn more at reiok.org. This has been the Four Star Leadership Podcast. Now it's your turn, Four Star listeners. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and let us know what you thought of this episode. Be sure to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, and tune in next month for our next episode that airs every last Friday each month. Go be great. The LaBar family is a fourth-generation Oklahoma family. That may not sound like a long time, but our grandfathers were born here, within the Comanche Nation, before the land run. We are the proudest sponsor of the Tommy Franks Four Star Leadership Podcast. We hope listeners will heed the words of these distinguished men and women who have served our country at the highest levels and across all walks of life.